So I'd like to introduce uh, Ashley Brim, and her introduction was written by Connor Malley. Ashley has a secret to tell you, but it's a funny secret. One, because it's obvious, or should be, and two, because it's not like most secrets about her. It's about you. Something is unglamorous, hideously, and beautifully wrong with you, with everyone in this room, with us all. And Ashley knows it. Don't ask how. If there is a huge tunnel, I'm sorry, if there's a huge tunnel board opening running through you, two gaping holes on either side of you, big enough for a jum jumbo jet to fly through, and there is, Ashley's sonorous and emotionally searing writing is the oil lamp perched right inside there, right in your gut, casting shadows against the nearest walls and finding at all costs a way to celebrate those haunted shadows flung across the dark world. That there is nothing wrong with being broken and fractured and troubled, that there is, paradoxically, everything right about being broken, fractured, and troubled is what she wants you to know, is the other part of the secret she has for you. And is arguably, as her writings show again and again, in heart-trending, at once del delicate and furious prose, the most important thing to know and with which to walk away. Ashley Broom. of people I would like to thank, um, so I won't. Um, <laughs> I just want to thank, thank generally my CCA family, all my colleagues and professors for always continuing to inspire, encourage, and support me. Um, thanks to all my friends who are here tonight. And thanks to my family, my parents, and my brother who flew in from Maryland, so thank you. <laughs> um, I'm going to be reading an excerpt from a short story called The Fair uh, from my collection of short stories called What Did You Expect to Find? When the sun was setting over the fair and our 20 hours of community service working the horse ride were over, Nora looped her arm through mine and we walked out to the parking lot. What are Mike and Simon doing at your car? I asked. I told you, we're hanging out with them, Nora said. I started to remind her about what happened the last time guys invited us to drink. It's just a fair, Mora, she interrupted, waving at the boys, her face beaming. Her hips swayed as we got closer to them, and I tightened my grip on her arm. As we approached the car, Simon pushed a button to pop the trunk. Inside were cups, mixers, and a huge bottle of vodka. I don't think I'm supposed to drink on my acne medication, I whispered to Nora. <laughs> Nora smiled. One won't kill you, she said, slipping her arm around my shoulders. They mixed drinks and we sipped them by the open trunk. The warm summer night sky shielded us from people coming in and out of the fair, but the more we drank, the more we didn't care who saw us. Which, with each sip, Simon and Mike seemed to expand, their chests pointing up as if to reveal some sort of proof we couldn't see, heads bopping to a mutual beat we couldn't hear. Simon did most of the talking, his voice loud and rough, Mike silently agreeing with everything, his thick face taking mouthfuls of vodka with ease. They made jokes about the permanent fair employees, mocking everything from their country accents to their faded clothing. I could only see the wilting look in their eyes, the leathered patterns on their faces, like every day had added an extra layer, but I didn't say anything. Occasionally, Mike would glance at me. Our eyes would meet, a moment of some kind passing between us, and I thought perhaps this was what it was like to actually like someone, a surge between two people without understanding it but wanting to. The vodka cradled my brain so that everything looked soft and shiny, and when Mike moved to stand next to me, I let him. I couldn't help let, but let loose the sides of my mouth and lean just slightly back into him, feeling the heat of his arm against mine, the pressure, as if the entire fair was twirling inside me, its colors and movement bursting to get out. I tilted my head back into the black sky, the enormous curving space stretching like time where anything was possible. Nora's giggles shook my thoughts back into the parking lot, where everything seemed to shimmer from the tilt world's light spinning across its dust. I eyed Mike as he poured more vodka into his cup, wondering what he was thinking, if maybe we would kiss later. I instinctively wetted my lips, thoughts moving around in my head like the Ferris wheel, remembering the first and last time I had ever been kissed. The ringing of La Cucaracha made me look over to Nora. 
Simon's hands grasped her body, his face lingering at her neck. She pushed his hands off his hips, digging into her purse. She held out her phone. It's your mom, she said, laughing behind her hand. I took the phone from her, seeing the words more as mom flash on the screen. Nobody moved, nobody said anything. All we could hear was La Cucaracha and the sounds of laughter from the fair. I flipped open the phone and Nora's eyes bulged out as if to say, I can't believe you're about to answer. I knew mom would say I needed to come home, that I was about to be late for curfew. I scanned the word, oh, sorry. I scanned the word mom, sharpened between the contrast of the flashing green screen and the darkness around us. And as I felt Mike lean into me, I snapped the phone shut and handed it back to Nora. Screw her, I said with a force unnatural to me. Everyone cheered, and Mike slung his arm around my shoulder, leaving a slick of warm moisture. They poured gl large glasses, and we toasted one last drink to the horse Mr. Steve. Walking toward the entrance, I swayed back and forth between Mike and Nora. The entrance lights haloed, and I could smell Mr. Steve's pen. When a fair employee stamped our tickets, I thought about how different it felt to enter the fair as a guest. In front of the bumper cars, Mike made a comment about my shirt. He towered over me, somehow larger inside the lights of the fair. He reached out and rubbed my shirt on my collarbone and then slowly moved his fingers down my chest. When I looked away, he looped his arm around my shoulders. Children screamed and ran around with fistfuls of cotton candy. Bright lights flashed and the ride spun with incredible force. I felt the vodka seeping through me and realized everything was moving too fast. So, Simon, you never really told us your story, Nora said with slightly slurred S's. Yeah, it's not really a story, Mike replied. Simon pointed to the mind eraser. We should go on that ride, he said. Yeah, right, Nora giggled. I would vomit everywhere. So, why did you have to do community service, I asked, trying to sound like I really didn't care. Simon shot me an annoyed look. Really nothing, just stupid shit, he said. Yeah, like some vandalism. It was bullshit, just like your alcohol citation, Mike said. He smiled at me, and I noticed for the first time the gap in his lower teeth. We paid a few dollars for tickets for some games. We threw rings on cones and tossed hacky sacks through clown mouths. We bought ice cones, and Simon and Mike tried to win Nora a bear. They high-fived when they won three live hermit crabs in a cl clear plastic container and said, I'd always wanted hermit crabs, even though Dad referred to them as sand roaches. But Nora didn't seem too thrilled. She had wanted the bear. She accepted the gift and then pouted at me. What am I going to do with three hermit crabs, she whispered. We rode the Ferris wheel and walked through the crazy mirror house. In the mirror house's dark corners, we shared Simon's flask of vodka. Simon kissed Nora, and I watched myself multiply in the mirrors around me. Moving slowly along the fragmented corridors, the layers of mirrors kept me from seeing Mike directly. I watched in the cascading gray shadows, flashes of images echoing back and forth as he reached his hand toward mine, just to barely miss it. His jagged teeth stretched across a thousand reflections in the mirrors around me. Three months earlier, Jack Leibowitz had called and invited us to the field party. I watched Nora in the mirror, her mouth parting slightly as she applied mascara, purple and black eyeshadow, concealer and brush. I dabbed a minimal amount of brown and gold eyeshadow onto my own lids. We walked across Nora's lawn to her car, Nora's hot pink miniskirt glowing in the light of the setting sun, fireflies blinking all around us. Children carting flashlights ran between their houses, their giggles reverberating around the cul-de-sac. We jumped into Nora's red Honda Prelude, and she sped out of the development, racing streetlights as they flashed on, one by one, down the street. Rolling all the windows down, we, raged to jam we jammed to rage against the machine and set our hair free to fly around our faces. When we arrived at the field party, people yelled Nora's name. They stood to greet her, handed her a beer, and walked her over to where Jack Leibowitz was coolly standing. Lacey w smiled and waved to me from the ground in the shadows outside the bonfire. Better view of the stars, she said, as she twisted a long piece of grass around her finger. She handed me a beer, and I looked over at Nora. She was surrounded by three guys, including Jack, her head tilted back with laughter. Her hand held Jack's arm, the other a beer. I probably shouldn't have one, I said. Why not, asked Lacey. I gestured to Nora. I'll probably be driving home, I said. Always the responsible one, Lacey replied. 
As I listened to Lacey talk about her struggle with math, her hatred for Mr. Benstein, and her crush on Calvert, who was currently making out with Kelly on the other side of the fire, I understood why she'd rather have a view of the stars. I kept glancing at Nora. She was surrounded by those guys dressed in dark collared shirts, baggy khakis and backwards caps, all gesturing and leaning in toward her. Nora finally looked in my direction and we made eye contact. She smiled, glanced sidelong at Jack, and smiled back at me. Lacey was in the middle of a sentence when I excused myself. When I walked up to Nora and squeezed her elbow, she turned and ushered me into their circle. Could one of you guys give Emma smoke, Nora asked. A guy with a deep voice gave me a cigarette that Jack Leibowitz lit. Then all the attention reverted back to Nora. She towered over everyone, and the fire illuminated her entire form, dancing around her white shirt and pink miniskirt, shining in the circle of boys dressed in darker fabrics. Everyone stood in small groups chatting. Every once in a while, a group would cheer. I would look to see boys taking shots and bonging and shotgunning beers. Girls giggled and leaned against each other to get attention from the boys they wanted to lean against. People drank and danced around the fire. They smoked cigarettes and talked about getting out of there. They talked about applying to colleges in a couple years. They talked about sports and rumors and gossip. Their conversations all the same, the same slow buildup, the same interjections leading to a low rumble across the field. I leaned against Nora, who leaned against Jack. We all listened to Nora tell a story of her parents when they were hippies traveling the country. Her lips had a way of controlling each syllable, like she took pleasure in speaking her words, as if she liked the way they tasted. I looked around the group to see if anyone else noticed. They seemed to have each taken a piece of her body with their eyes. The guy with a deep voice claimed her legs. Jack claimed her tits. The next thing I knew, everyone was running. People yelled, grabbed their backpacks, sweaters, ran one direction, saw more police, turned and ran the other way. Nora grabbed my hand. We can't run, I yelled. Come on, she said, pulling. But we didn't do anything wrong. But I felt a hand on my shoulder and a flashlight blinded me. Shit, Nora muttered. But we didn't do anything wrong, I repeated. The police sat us down on the curb and asked for our names. I asked if we could call our parents. When he nodded, I borrowed Nora's phone and called home. Mom answered, where are you? I'm outside of Centennial Fields, I said. The police said I could call you. And she didn't say anything, even though all I wanted was a reaction, her to yell, to come get me. I sat on the curb, bathed in red and blue lights, and saw my dad pull up, shaking his head. I hadn't seen him in days, and he emerged from his car in his suit, tie pulled loose, shirt wrinkled. With his feet pointed outward, he walked with a slow purpose I used to mimic when I was a kid, large strides, toes pointed out. When a kid in seventh grade made fun of me for per permanently picking up the habit, I tried to undo what I'd learned. It took me forever to teach my toes to be centered again. I secretly wanted them to stay pointed out. My dad seemed huge compared to his car, compared to the darkness mixed with red and blue lights. He towered over the policemen as he walked up to them. He pointed me out to an officer, his thick fingers jabbing the air. They chatted for a minute. They even had a laugh. When he finally came over to me, he had lost his cordial demeanor. He waved me to stand up. Looks like he blew a zero zero on the breathalyzer, he said. Great job there. You can't even get an alcohol citation right. I folded, <laughs> I folded my arms across my chest, scowling at him. Whatever, I said. Yeah, whatever, he mimicked as he gripped my neck between his thumb and pointer finger, navigating my body toward the officers. I'm taking my daughter home, he stated flatly. Not without a citation, one of them said. But she didn't drink, my dad countered. The policeman surveyed him and then looked at me. I stared over at Nora. Her parents weren't around. She sat with Lacey and the guy with the deep voice. I couldn't see Jack Leibowitz. She was around it, the policeman concluded, handing my dad a copy of this alcohol citation. Then, softening, he continued, she'll probably just have to do some community service. Dad shoved the citation in his pocket and steered me toward the car. What about Nora? I asked meekly. Nora's parents can take care of that, he replied. As soon as we got into his car, a Steely Dan tune came on the radio and he turned up the music. He tapped the steering wheel and bobbed his head as if I wasn't there and I wondered if this was how he spent most of his time. I looked around the car trying to remember when the last time I had been in it. It was so familiar, the worn leather seats, the stain on the dashboard, the small smiley face on the door I had drawn on that trip to Luray Caverns. But it smelled different, like gym socks and too much lavender spray instead of juice at McDonald's. Even the music flooding the car, the music I had grown up listening to, music I knew all the words to, made me feel like I was somehow off tempo. 
I thought about what I should have said to my dad instead of whatever. Like, you're right, dad. I can't get an alcohol citation right, just like you can't get being a dad right. Or, sorry, not all of us love alcohol like you do. I smirked to myself, feeling a little dangerous for even thinking about saying such things to my dad. I glanced over at him, worried for a moment that he might somehow hear what I was thinking, but his eyes darted outside the car. I stared at his profile, the steady white overtaking his hair, lines like roots sprouting from his eyes and mouth, lines that grew more intricate, deeper every day. I instantly felt guilty. I wished I could have said something, but the words fumbled in my mouth. Even more, I wish he would say something, say anything, explain what I had done wrong, why he had been the one to pick me up, what mom would say when I got home, why he hadn't answered mom's calls when it was his own sister in town, why he had started that stupid company when all it did was make them fight, make him never come home, explain why he and mom never really looked each other in the eye anymore. Did you see that? He asked, knocking me out of my thoughts. It looked like a huge deer, he continued, slowing a little and gesturing back toward the tree line. I didn't see it, I said, craning my neck to peer at the woods, past the concrete and eerie gray from the headlights, the yellow line blurred by our speed. Oh, he replied, still tapping the steering wheel, still searching for the deer, and with each streetlight we passed under, he flickered in and out of the darkness. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you.